This is the Building Automation Monthly Podcast with Phil Zito, episode 114. Hey folks, welcome to the Building Automation Monthly Podcast. And in this episode, I will be taking you through the first part of a two-part series titled BAS Optimization Strategies. This is something a lot of you have been asking me about for... <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit this, probably the better part of a year now, I'm finally getting to answer these questions. So, like I said, this series is going to be discussing optimization. And in the first episode, this episode, we're going to be tackling what optimization is, and more importantly, what it isn't. Because in order for us to talk through optimization sequences in order for us to actually optimize a building automation system we need to understand what optimization is so in this episode we're going to dive through what optimization is we're going to talk through the upstream and downstream effects of optimization we're going to talk through optimization versus retro commissioning and we're going to go through my five step process for optimizing a building automation system. So there's gonna be a lot packed into this episode. If you don't have your notepad out, you're gonna wanna go and grab your notepad to take some notes. And just real quick before I start off the episode, I just want to make a real quick announcement. If you haven't already done so, I really encourage you to either go into iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, whatever software you use to listen to these episodes and to subscribe to the podcast. That way you will get this podcast delivered to your phone every Monday at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time. That's when these podcast episodes drop and I don't want you to miss a single one because I've laid out the episode list for the entire year And there is a lot of really good in-depth application or applicable, not I was going to say application specific. I've been working on uh, updating my programming course since I keep all my courses constantly updated. And I've been thinking a lot about applications. No, but there's going to be a lot of applicable knowledge as part of these upcoming episodes. So with that being said, let's dive in. What is optimization? Well, optimization, quite simply, is identifying an outcome you want to achieve and then figuring out a way to get there more efficiently. So, for example, and this is this is a really silly example, but hey, whatever. If I want to get across the road, I can go walk all the way to the crosswalk and walk across the crosswalk and walk back where I want to go, or I can go straight across the road. Now there's pros and cons to each strategy, right? One strategy has me going across the crosswalk, which less likely I'm going to get hit, less likely I'm going to get a ticket, but it takes more time. Another strategy has me walking right across the road, might get hit by a car, might get hit by, you know, one of those automated Uber drivers. And, I might get a ticket, who knows, but I get across faster. So whenever you're thinking about optimization for your building automation system, for example, you want to save energy. Well, you could just turn off the entire building. I guarantee you that would save energy. Probably wouldn't make your tenants very happy, probably would get you fired, but you would save some energy. So whenever you think of optimization, you need to balance out two things, the outcome and the action. The action that you take to achieve the outcome, that is the act of optimization. Now, one of the things that, so when I'm recording this, I uh, had a consulting call this morning with a lady. I'm going to change her name because I don't have her permission to share this. So it was a lady, we'll just call her Mel, and she brought up about whenever you're optimizing, you really got to be aware of the upstream and downstream effects. 
And she's absolutely right. And that's something that I think a lot of us don't think about. We get so focused on the action of optimization that we don't think of the upstream and downstream effects of that act of optimization. And that's why when I get to my five-step plan to optimize a building automation system, it's going to be so important that we really focus in on the cause and effect associated with any form of optimization. So let's think about what this would look like. Let's look at a upstream and a downstream effect. So a downstream effect of optimization would be adjusting chiller set points. Now there's a couple different ways that you can reset the primary chilled water set point on your chiller. One of which, a common way of doing it, and it's the way I often suggest, is looking at building load. You either look at your delta T times your GPM to calculate your load in BTUs. You look at average valve position, and if you understand the BTU load of each coil, and the coils are actually not fouled, then you can calculate load. And you can use load to effectively adjust the chilled water set point. But there's another way. And this way is looking at outdoor air temp. And in my opinion, resetting temperature based on outdoor air temp is a horrible, horrible optimization strategy because you aren't taking into effect load. And load is so important. If you have an entirely glass building that is mainly south-facing and you're looking at outdoor air temp, and you are saying, oh, well, it's uh, kind of cool outside. I'm going to go and raise my chilled water supply temp. That is a bad idea because what if it's super sunny? My house that I live in, and this is a very small scale example. My house has all southern facing windows. I can go down to almost 20 degrees outside before I ever have to run the heat. And that is because of, on a very sunny day, the amount of solar gain I get through my southern facing windows is enough to heat the house. Now, if you're solely looking at outdoor air temp and you're not actually looking at load, you can start to create spots within your building that actually get quite hot and so that is why it's so important to think of the downstream effects but what about the upstream effects what does that look like what would some upstream effects be like well let me tell you about one of the most common ones i see a lot of folks get super excited about economizers they realize that they're bringing in or not bringing in outdoor air and they say to themselves man if i could just get control over the economizer i could reduce the humidity i could go and potentially bring more fresh air i could use free cooling i could do all these really cool things and yeah yeah that's that's pretty much true that's the purpose of economizer control free cooling co2 control fresh air being able to take all the advantages of those things. However, there's a dark side to economizer control, and that is a dark side downstream effect. Think about building pressurization, right? You return some air and maybe you exhaust some air and you basically take in more air then you bring out and that makes your building positive, which means the air inside your building is pushing out. Or if you bring in less than you exhaust out, then you have a negative building, which means it's pulling air in. Certain buildings you want to be negative, certain buildings you want to be positive. I'm not gonna really get into that. It's a much longer conversation. Suffice to say, what do you think happens when you take a building static pressure set point and sequence that was set up not 
to operate with economizer control. And you introduce a bunch of economizers throughout the building. You've done this super awesome thing. You've went and got this project, which on paper has a great ROI. I mean, you're controlling the economizer, you're using free cooling, and you're dumping a bunch of air potentially into the building that wasn't there before. Now, the problem with that is, if that air isn't properly exhausted, you're gonna start to get doors that don't close right. You're gonna start to get whistling effects near any place where the air can actually exit the building. And that is a sign of improper pressure control. And that is a very common downstream effect with economizer retrofits. But the thing is, a lot of folks don't think about that. It seems to be that the art of systems thinking, something I cover heavily in my Control Sequence Fundamentals course, is just disappearing from the trade. It seems to be, I, I meet a lot of folks who will go into a classroom and they will troubleshoot the classroom and it's a cooling only box and they're like, man, it's so hot in this classroom. Cooling only blocks must be failed. And they spend hours and hours and hours on this cooling only box, not to take into account that there's an actually a fin tube radiator along the perimeter of the room that is causing heat and they're not taking into account that heat they're not taking into account the entire system so you see that when folks dive into economizers and they put them in because on paper they're great ROIs but on paper they also go and they don't take into account the non-paper effects the pressurization effects, the potential load on preheat or reheat or cooling coils that wasn't accounted for when this system was designed. So that's what I mean when I say downstream effects. Now, where do these kind of projects most often occur? Well, they occur in very well-meaning retro commissioning projects. There's this misunderstanding in the industry, and that misunderstanding is the difference between retro commissioning and optimization. I'm going to make this really, really simple for you. Retro commissioning is simply recommissioning the building. In its purest sense, you're going, you're looking up the sequence of operations, and you're making sure that the building systems are adhering to the sequence of operations. However, for whatever reason, retro commissioning is mutated into this bastardized kind of Frankenstein monster of retro optimization commissioning. And it's basically where you go and you look at the sequence and you say, hey, this sequence would make a lot more sense like this. So rather than going and actually getting the sequence working, you just, whatever, and you just go and you optimize. You go and you start making all these changes, never really paying attention to was the system working in the first place. And this is really, really nasty. This is how a lot of issues get mixed. You'll see where a lot of retro commissioning projects happen. And then you talk to the owner a couple months later and they're like, man, I have all these failures in my building now. I don't get it. I thought retro commissioning was supposed to fix everything. And in its purest sense, retro commissioning would have fixed everything. But as I mentioned, we often go about not retro commissioning, but retro opta commissioning, whatever. And what that causes is we never make sure the original system works prior to going and making sure that we've made the proper optimization choices on a working system. Now, let me be clear. 
That's not to disparage folks who do retro commissioning. I know plenty of folks out there who do amazing jobs at retro commissioning. However, that is to point out that if you're going to do retro commissioning, do retro commissioning. Don't go and do this. And I've seen this time and time again. We have three schools. Our schools are 1970s. That's when everything was installed. We're going to retro commission, but we're only going to retro commission a little bit. We're not going to make sure the actuators still work. We're not going to, you know, go and replace the inlet veins with VFDs. Uh, we're not going to check our damper linkages. We're not going to make sure our valves are, you know, not clogged and have Delta T syndrome. We're just going to retro optimize. We're going to put some new controls on, use all of the existing control devices because we're being cheap and we don't want to buy new control devices because after all, you know, I grew up in the pneumatics land and that stuff runs from, you know, for 50 years, I don't need to change it. So why do I need to change this? This is the mentality a lot of folks have. And that mentality causes you to go and make really poor choices like I'm going to put controls on this, you know, you go and I'm going to expect it to turn into a Ferrari. And then when I run it like a Ferrari and I start implementing Ferrari like sequences with you go parts and everything starts breaking, I'm going to go yell at the BAS contractor because they broke everything and it all worked before they did it. I know that this sounds similar, and I know that a lot of you have you lived this before. So when you're doing retro commissioning, do retro commissioning. Don't do retro optimization commissioning. All right, if we beat that horse to death, everyone clear on the difference between optimization and retro commissioning? That is really important, especially if you're someone who you do analytics, which then drive to retro commissioning projects, or you're someone who is an ESCO, an energy, what is that, energy savings company, if I remember correctly, or it's energy services company. I could Google that. I'm not going to right now. But essentially what you do is you guarantee savings by implementing ECMs, energy conservation measures, with as well facility improvement measures, and those end up reducing operational costs and utility costs and those cost savings offset the cost of the project. All right, so now with all of that foundation in place, it's time to dive in to my five-step plan to optimize a building automation system. So here's the deal. This five-step plan, this is not going to have any hands-on technical effort. I'll be honest with you, the actual act of implementing optimization strategies is pretty freaking simple for a semi-competent programmer. But here's what a lot of folks don't do. They don't follow these five steps, and so they choose either the wrong optimization strategy, one that won't achieve the outcome, or they choose a inefficient optimization strategy, one that will achieve the outcome, but not as efficiently as it possibly could. So here's the five steps for optimizing a building automation system. The first thing you need to do is you need to identify the goal and the outcome. All right, now why did I say goal and outcome? Because those sound very similar, right? A goal, however, is defined and clear. An outcome is just an outcome. So the outcome may be I want to decrease energy utilization or I want to increase energy efficiency. That is my outcome. My goal is to actually go and reduce my utility consumption by 10%. Do you see the difference between an outcome and a goal? A goal is going to be specific. It's going to be measurable. It's basically the SMART goals, right? You're going to, and I'm not going to try to remember the acronyms for SMART. I know that it's specific, measurable, actionable, 
realistic and timely, if I remember correctly. And what that means is you want to take an outcome, which is I want to reduce my utility spend. You want to work with the owner to get it to be a smart goal. If you do not do this, you will be on warranty calls. You will have finger pointing. You'll have punch lists. Everyone will go, but you said I was going to have utility spend reduction and you've reduced my utility by 20%. But my friend who went to a conference and he heard a speaker and the speaker said that if I'm not getting 150% utility reduction, then it's not working right. And so um, my friend's an accountant and he knows this kind of stuff. So you must not be doing it right. Do you see? I mean, yeah, that's a little exaggerated, but that happens all the time. So you want to get specific, right? We're going to reduce your utility spend of what? Your utility spend for lighting? Your utility spend for HVAC? Are we going to reduce your electrical utility? Are we going to reduce your gas? Is this, what is, what are we going to reduce? Demand? Consumption? What? Then, measurable. How are we going to measure it? Are we going to have a baseline? Do you even have a baseline? Do you have the metering at the level we need in order to measure it? Actionable, okay? So is this something, and also realistic at the same time, is this something that we can take action on? And is it realistic? Reducing utility spend by 150%, while amazing, is not realistic. Uh, yeah, if you figure out how to do that, just send me an email at phil at philzito.com. I will gladly take 10% of the profit and I'll help you get that out on the market because that is a moneymaker. Anyways, and timely. When are we going to do this? How soon are we going to do this? That is so important. If you get nothing else out of this episode, use SMART goals for your optimization projects. Okay? All right. Next, you need to grab a piece of paper and identify all the ways to achieve the goal. Now, I'm going to tell you something I hated working in corporate America was brainstorming and socializing ideas. I quite frankly, I think it's stupid to go to folks who have no clue about what I'm doing and ask them for feedback on my idea. So I've socialized it. So that it's worthwhile and people feel included. You know what? You have no freaking clue what you're talking about. So why am I going to include you in figuring out my ideas? That is the dumbest idea ever. I'm sorry for those of you who love socialization and inclusion. But asking folks who have no clue about something for their feedback is a recipe for disaster. So here's what you should do. You're smart. You've got a lot of knowledge. Go and write down all the different ways you think you could do this. Trust me, you think that people know more than they actually know, and you think that you know less than you actually know. I guarantee you, you know more than you actually think you know, and people, I could say from experience, myself included, know less than you think they do. No one knows everything. But I guarantee if you've been in this field for a couple of years, you've experienced a lot of stuff. So sit down with a piece of paper and write out all the ways you could possibly achieve this goal. You will go and get feedback on this, but not during this step. Okay, right now you want to keep the crazies outside the fence and you want to protect your ideas and figure it out. You will go and get feedback, but you're getting feedback, not suggestions. Very important difference. All right. So you go and say, hey, we want to increase energy efficiency. Well, we could turn off the building. We could turn off the lights, adjust set points, utilize the economizer, optimize schedules, tie control to occupancy, install VFDs, maintain systems, all sorts of strategies we could take. So list them all out. The sky's the limit. Just put them all on paper. Now, you need to go and write two buckets next to each idea, pros and cons. And you want to weigh the pros and cons of each idea. While turning off the building would probably be pretty energy efficient, 
There's a lot of cons to that. Likewise, going and optimizing schedules, that, that may have a lot of pros to it. At the same time, it may not. Maybe you already have schedules optimized. So you want to list out all the pros and cons for each idea you've come up with. From here, you want to rank the list, okay? This is where you're going to go and you're going to order the list and you want to try to find the top three ideas. Once you have those top three ideas, then you go back and you say, here are my three ideas. Here's the pros and cons of each idea, Mr. Owner. Which idea would you like to implement? And things you should be thinking of, by the way, back in step three, are you should be thinking of not only the pros and cons, but who's going to operate this? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to implement it? All of these things, right? So then we move to step four. We've ranked the list and we go and we ask for feedback on the list. This is when you get feedback. When you've narrowed it down to three ideas, this is when you should go get feedback. And then finally, implement the list. Step five. You got to implement it, right? You've gotten feedback. You've picked the one that will meet your optimization goal. And now you go and implement it. So there you have it, folks. Those are the five steps to optimizing a BAS. Just to recap on them, step one, identify the goals and outcomes. Step two, identify the ways to achieve the goal. Step three, weigh the pros and cons of each way and determine the cost of install and service, who's going to maintain it, etc. Step four is to rank that list and get feedback. And step five is to implement the list. So we covered a lot in this episode and you can find all of the notes at buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 114. And in the next episode, we're going to be diving through some of the most common optimization strategies. We'll be unpacking a lot of optimization strategies in episode 115. So I want to talk to you real quickly about something that I haven't announced. I don't really talk about it a lot. But it's something that I've been doing kind of below the radar, and it's been having a profound effect on the people I've been doing that with. And that is my one-on-one -on -one consulting. So if you run a business or an operations team, and you want to figure out strategies to grow your team, to increase your efficiency as far as how you execute projects, how you structure your team, then you definitely want to reach out to me. If you're in sales, and you want to think of new ways to go and call on customers, new ways to serve the market. You want to have ideas around strategies that you can take to be more effective rather than just hoping you're low on bid day. Then you definitely want to reach out to me. And if you are responsible for training and you're trying to figure out how to develop your team, then that is something you want to reach out to me about. I've got a vast experience in building automation. I've been in so many different roles. I've been in operations. I've been in sales. I've been in technical integration. I've worked with analytics and I've trained over 2,400 students. Yes, that is 2,400 students on building automation. So you can say I know a thing or two and I'm pretty darn good at it. So if you would like to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, it's not cheap. It's not cheap. It is my most expensive product out there because you are getting one-on-one -on -one access to my personal time. So if that sounds like something you would like to explore, then I encourage you to reach out to me at phil at philzito.com or to simply go to the work with Phil link that will be at the building automation monthly dot com one fourteen page where this episode will be hosted. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I am so excited every week to be able to serve you, to be able to talk to you. I'm so thankful for every single one of you. 
Thank you so much for being here. And if you haven't already, be sure to go into iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode. I'll talk to you again next week. Thanks a ton. Take care.